right, gang, we're back again. Once again, uh, Coach Rowell here with Scott. Thank you, Scott, for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, I wanted to jump right on in and um, kind of question, pose a question to you about uh, mm -hmm. that I've been seeing around on the internet regarding boat and RV storage mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. from a vacant piece of land. I know on the surface, it sounds, sounds quite interesting. It, you just get a vacant piece of land, you mm -hmm. get it rezoned uh, with the local county and then throw down some gravel uh, and then allow, maybe put up a fence and then allow people to to store their boats and RVs. Sounds like a pretty simple deal. But I know there's got to be a catch mm -hmm. to it. Some mm -hmm. other considerations that most are not are not thinking of. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, like anything, um, it, it sounds easy. Storage, self-storage sounds easy and boat and RV storage sounds uh, even easier for what you just mentioned. You know, let's just put a fence around and put some gravel down. But you know, any anytime you're looking to do any type of development um, in storage, boat and RV, you're you're developing that piece of ground. It, it all starts before you buy it and before you begin to put gravel or a fence around it. How do you know there's enough demand for it? I mean, simply you could go around and drive around to the other storage facilities or boat and RV facilities that are nearby and see if you know they are full do they have a, a waiting list and uh, for boat and rv people will travel a little bit farther because they only go and grab it a couple times a, a year um, in many cases uh, whereas self-storage they usually want to be a little closer so when we do our market studies you know we want to be within one to three miles we want to find out what's um you know what's around us and what the market looks like but with um boat and rv storage if it's strictly boat and rv storage you know people will go out a little bit further for um you know because they only have to go every so often so we may go five to seven miles in terms of our radius around that and then do a market study to find out, you know, what is the occupancy at the facilities that are either just boat and RV storage or if they have self-storage and offering boats and RV. So we can do that preliminarily just to see if there's a waiting list and what that looks like. But at the end of the day, again, if we're going to be begin to invest some serious dollars in a piece of land and doing making the improvements on it, we would like to do a feasibility study, at the very least a desktop feasibility study from a consultant to really determine and you know kind of look at all of the competition within five to seven miles, um, look at the numbers, the projections, and uh, get a better understanding. And if we're going to go to a lender to buy the land and make those improvements um, or private equity, we're going to need a feasibility study anyways, that third-party verification. So those are the first steps that, that we take in, in looking at a piece of ground. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of that feasibility study, let's say it sounds mm -hmm. seems pretty good. There was a couple of different angles where um, I saw in some forums people were posting uh, some, I know they're all kind of hypotheticals, but mm -hmm. uh, with some, there was one poster I saw that said uh, they had a commercial property already, like a, a bit of a warehouse um, mm -hmm. storage facility, uh, but it wasn't like a self storage and they had a lot of extra land mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just thinking, mm -hmm. you know what, it's not doing anything. I don't necessarily want to build anything out. Mm -hmm. Do they mm -hmm. have to, would you still recommend a feasibility study or could they just say now it's, it's available and see what happens? I mean, it's, I kind of see where they're coming from. There's no necessary, mm -hmm. there's not mm -hmm. necessarily any extra overhead on mm -hmm. their part, but they could just advertise it and see what happens. Would that be advisable or no? I, I, I think so. I, I think you need to be prepared. However, if you're, if you're going to offer, you know, 10, 15, 20 spots, um, you still would like to have some type of uh, access to it, uh, security around it, some fencing and, and what have you. If you're just doing it for just a handful of folks, I mean, you could, but if you're really looking at it as a revenue stream that you're going to keep in place for a while, you, you should treat it as such as more of a business. So, I mean, if you've got an acre, then then you begin to start looking at it a little bit uh, differently. If you've got a handful of spots that you're going to offer to somebody and let them know that um, we're renting this out, you have a, you certainly still have a, a lease that is, you know, every bit as good and as strong as a lease that you would if you had a boat and RV storage facility so that you're covered. But um, you certainly let them know that this is not fenced, it's not gated. It may, you know, depending on the security you have, disclose that as well, um, just so that they know what they're looking at. And, and hopefully your discounted price will reflect the fact that it doesn't have some of the amenities as uh, the competition would. So, it's, it, it's not that difficult to get into that business, as you mentioned, if they want to generate some additional revenue, um, but just make sure that you're disclosing and, and treating it um, with you know, the same amount of care as, a, as you would if you were renting out um, hundreds of spots. Mm -hmm. Now, compare that with, mm -hmm. I'm thinking as an entry point into storage in general, mm -hmm. would boat and RV storage, considering you don't have to build structures, the feasibility study, let's say somebody has... A, a bit of a budget to mm -hmm. to to go to make a go at it um, realistically. Mm -hmm. Would that be easier, harder, more advisable? Not as advisable as 
say, acquiring a, um, an underperforming mm-hmm. existing facility and turning that around? Hmm. What would you say about that? Well, that, well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think it's a little di- more difficult uh, in, in some instances to buy an existing facility that is a turnaround. First of all, if, if somebody's getting into the business, you know, and, and they're a beginner, uh, well, they may not have the knowledge, the skill set, or the experience to be able to turn around a, an existing facility. Uh, on the flip side, if you've got a facility that already has an income stream in place, it's much easier for a beginner to come into the bank and to say, it's underperforming. Here's the occupancy. Here's my business plan. Here's what I am looking to do. I'm going to get a consultant. I'm going to get a, a property management company to assist in this. You know, you may be able to build that case. Now, if you if you're looking to just uh, buy a piece of ground or it's a piece of ground that's gravel already and you're putting up storage, yeah, there's not a, a you know a lot of experience or a, you know, a heavy skill set that is needed to be able to do that. And and let's not forget, Roella, um, you know, storage really in its in its early stages in many cases was a, just a, a land bank for people. You know, so they would buy a land and expecting in the future that um, it would be whatever. If I put a structure on it, um, you know, storage buildings, it's really easy. They're inexpensive. You tear them down. And then, you know, when the guys come by or the gals and want to build a hotel or a Walmart or, or McDonald's, then I'll sell them the land. And it just generates revenue, pays for the taxes in the meantime. Um, so until we found out that self-storage is one of the best asset classes and has a higher and best use than <laughs> sometimes putting all those other assets on it. So if that's what your goal is, then obviously it's much easier as a land bank to just fence it, gravel it, and do boat and RV storage, and then figure out what to do with it later. Um, if it is self-storage, phase it in, build the buildings on top of that, or keep it as storage. And then if you're looking for a higher and better use as um, if you're in the, the path of progress and, and there's growth coming into the market or near your facility, then it'll generate some revenue until you're able to either develop it yourself or sell it off to somebody who wants to develop something that is, again, a higher and better use for that land in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of, I don't know about in other states, uh, but in Florida, I see a lot of uh, empty land with with cattle on it because they know there's some mm-hmm. kind of a tax break correct yep. as well mm-hmm. so they're uh, yeah mm-hmm. I, when i see that in like odd places it's like there's residential with some retail and then there's farmland with mm-hmm. with cows i've since learned yep. that they're yep. probably land banking it because they're looking for future development yep yep correct mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah go ahead I, I was just thinking with with storage as a as a as a viable entry point with mm-hmm. boat and rv storage mm-hmm. um on that note, what, what are some considerations if someone said wanted to approach it intelligently and say, you know yeah. what, I understand, mm-hmm. I need to do my demographics, feasibility research. Mm-hmm. What are some key factors to consider in terms of mm-hmm. proximity? Yeah, well, I think um, to, to that point, if I could back up a step, obviously sure. somebody needs to know how to underwrite and look at this. So, you know, you, you've already done your homework. You looked at the, at the market. Here's what the rental rates are for boat and RV. Hopefully you have an idea of how much this land is going to cost and then get some, you know, basic bids for fencing, graveling, you know, what it's going to take to be able to convert this land and then model that out. How many units do we think we're going to be able to put on this site? You know, if we're going to, you know, put the lines in place, how many do we think we can park here? And again, outside of getting a, a feasibility study to do so, that's kind of the back of the napkin math. So that's that, that's really where you begin. But then in terms of proximity, um, again, there's we, we find that many of these boat and RV storage facilities, they may not be... Re- sometimes even close to densely populated neighborhoods or even towns. But if they're in a major metropolitan statistical area, one of the top 50 in the country, and the the next closest lake that everybody is interested in taking their boats down to is across this one highway, and you've got a piece of land that's right there off of that highway, and it's 5, 10, 15 miles down, down the road, that may be a good spot because it's inexpensive land. You've got a lot of it, seven, 10 acres or so, and it's on the way to the lake where anybody can easily pack up the car and uh, go down and pick up their boat on the way to the lake or their RV. And so there's, you know, it's it doesn't always have to be real close to home and nearby because of the way that people, again, store and the way they utilize um, their, their big toys, uh, the boats and their RVs, it doesn't have to be that close. So um, certainly if you're looking at boats, you want it to be okay. as near the water as possible. But uh, of course, the closer you get to water, the more expensive the land is. And uh, so anytime we can find a building, uh, perhaps a business or even a, a lumber yard, you know, those are, are very good properties for converting into storage as well as boat and RV, because you're usually starting with that seven to 10 acres. Um, they're, they're larger sites to begin with. The zoning may be right. 
and it would be hard for somebody else to come in there and um, find a better use for that to, to buy it and do something uh, different with it. So to the extent that you can find something with um, some large buildings on it, perhaps, but mostly, you know, the acreage that you need, and it's inexpensive, you know, those are the things that we're looking for. So uh, again, looking around, see what the market already has to hold, getting the consultants uh, involved to do a study, but then also driving the market and see, you know, what is available out there that may not even be on the market um, or even for sale to the public eye, but they may, may make a good boat and RV um, facility or site to develop. Mm -hmm. Now is, you mentioned something key there that, that I, I heard is mm -hmm. conversions. Mm -hmm. Are conversions still viable in the general sense, or is it really on a region to region specific basis still? Yeah, they're, they're viable everywhere. I mean, we, we like conversions um, for all, all the reasons that uh, they are, which is quicker to market. And you've got a shell, you've got buildings already in place. Um, perhaps you've got zoning, favorable zoning that um, is um, already favorable for storage, or it may need just a small variance or just permitting in some cases. And um, if it's in an infill location, if it's something to convert, you know, it typically was a business. So it's near residential. It's, a, it's got a population around it. It could be an infill location. And um, if it's a location that is uh, that can be purchased well enough, it could be from a business that has uh, gone down during COVID. Um, there's a lot of big boxes and medium boxes now that have been you know, that have gone under, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. And, and again, a rush to people just buying things online that has been accelerated by the pandemic. So um, we like we like conversions, and also banks can wrap their heads around this as a, as well because you're already partially there. It's a quicker time frame to open your doors versus um, going through the entire entire process for development and then getting uh, permits and getting all the bids from contractors uh, to build out an entire site and civil engineers versus something that's already been built out that you're now just converting with um, a smaller amount of construction and project management. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what? Something very recently on a personal experience that mm -hmm. I've had was you're talking about the conversions and, and the fact that mm -hmm. a lot of small, medium and big box stores have gone empty. Mm -hmm. I was actually going around um, uh, in Florida, driving around and, and actually riding my bike around uh, mm -hmm. a certain area that I was looking at actually flipping a house, mm -hmm. residential in the traditional sense. But I came across this um, this uh, retail plaza, uh -huh. um, two, two strips where there was obviously probably a supermarket as one anchor, but then a whole bunch of uh, maybe a dozen or so smaller retail units. Mm -hmm. And it was on a Sunday afternoon. I happened to be... Um, there happened to be one tenant at the end that wasn't there, but then I saw a pickup truck pull up to one of the empty units and a gentleman a little down mm -hmm. the way go in. So I rode yeah. my bike down there, knocked on the door. Turned out he was one of the owners, found out mm -hmm. a little bit. It's available for sale. Mm -hmm. But and when I told him that I was thinking, I do have partners who, who do conversions and I was thinking of uh, self-storage. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, the city would not go for that. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. said, if the city was, or, or the county or the local mm -hmm government was open to it he said probably could have sold this place seven times over mm -hmm. so being the persistent person that i am i was thinking mm -hmm. well if i did pursue it is mm -hmm. there a chance or what could what could we possibly do to potentially appeal to the local uh, authorities mm -hmm. have yeah. you had that kind of pushback because it was on a um, pretty oh. busy thoroughway Oh, oh, yes, we have. <laughs> yeah. So um, you, you first start by going down to the, you know, the zoning board. So go online. If you, if you, if you can find an address, uh, sometimes these are open pieces of land that they don't have an address on it. So you got to find the parcel. Uh, but if you have an address, then you go online and just about every municipality, you can go online and find out what the current zoning is um, for that property and for that piece of land. So you go online, you find out what the zoning is, and then you go to the city ordinance and find out what is permitted uh, within this C3 designation or I3U or you know whatever that is. And if self-storage is in there, then it may just take um, permitting to go forward. You have to get your project approved. Um, if it is not one of the permitted uses currently under that zoning, then yes, go talk to the zoning office and um, the higher up the better. And, uh, and ask them that question to say, hey, I'm looking at this piece of ground. Uh, it's not zoned for self-storage. You know, what has been the city's appetite for self-storage, either at this location or in general? And have any projects been recently, uh, you know, gone off 
got off the ground um, or have any projects that have come in front of the board or the city have they been turned down and for what reason just you know to get a sense um, to know whether you, you're going to face a lot of opposition or pushback um, or if they are now favorable to you know zoning for self-storage because they know that it does well and it generates cash and there are certain properties in in, in town that nobody's using and, and haven't found a good use for and so you may find that Although what that seller um, is saying is true, however, that may have been in the past. And now, you know, times have changed, the situation has changed, and some of these cities are coming around to the fact that um, they know that, that, that self-storage, they hold out for many reasons. Um, they're ugly, and they don't generate a lot of tax revenue. Um, I think they're beautiful, so I disagree, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't generate tax revenue. So yeah, you, you, you'll have a little bit of a challenge, but if they realize if it's sitting for a year, two, three years, not generating anything, you know, anybody and their brothers had an opportunity to come in and put another retail store in where this old retail store was or whatever the business was. And if they haven't done it by now, they probably won't. So now it's time to look at, you know, what can we put in here that's going to generate revenue? And these, these cities are finally coming around to that. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I'm going to, revisit that with a fresh set of eyes. I would. But mm -hmm. uh, thanks. I think that's good for, for this topic. I know you're traveling mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll kind of wrap up this one here. And then uh, there's actually a, another in-depth topic that I wanted to I wanted to discuss with you in the very next uh, episode. Perfect. All right. Can't wait. Thanks for watching. All right. So I'll see you in a few minutes. All right. We'll do. Thanks again for joining us here at Self Storage Investing. We really, really appreciate it. For more great content like this, make sure to click the subscribe button below this video and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Bigger Pockets. You can also visit us at our main website at selfstorageinvesting.com where you'll find even more free content, our ebook and registration to our free webinars and education courses and much, much more. Once again, for more great content like this, please click the subscribe button below. Thank you.